just uh, thank you uh, for having us. A quick comment I just want to make um, before we get started. So I, there's a lot of talk about incentives, and I learned about incentives this morning. Um, the, the call was to be here at 8.30 or so like that. There's going to be food and coffee and all that. So I got here at 9.00. Um, the student locusts had been there and there was literally zero. And not that I cared because I got my water and all, but it was a lesson in, you know, if you want students to show up, you provide food and, and, and a drink. So that's the uh, basics about incentives. Um, we've been talking about IRA, IRA. What is, I just want to get this real quick. What does the IRA represent? What is the IRA? No, I know what it. I know what the words are, Bonnie. Uh, but what is what? What is it? Incentive program. You're getting at it. What, it it's a big, freaking pot of money. Billions. It is a huge amount of money. And that money is going somewhere. It's like a pachinko machine, if you know it. It bangs around and it goes to various governments and states, and it comes down, and it funds stuff. Fun stuff. And that stuff has to fit in categories to be sustainable. That's what we're talking about here. I was here all morning and you were listening to all kinds of programs in governments and Bonnie talked about $250 million coming to the port and Matt, Matt's was a little bit more of his, but he was after government. It's all about government money going to pay for stuff. What's the stuff that they're paying for? And what we wanna talk about here today in different levels is what works? I mean, money bangs around and falls down into various places. What works and what doesn't work in terms of sustainability? We know the money works. It flows down and it gets people to do stuff. But what works in terms of sustainability? So we're going to go from the micro at the all the way at the end of the pipe, a uh, city up through the state and through a government and through a continent to see what works and then what doesn't work. So I want to talk with, start with you, Arana. City of Santa Monica. You got all this money banging down and it goes like this and this and it, and it big chunk of money shows up at your desk to help sustainability. What works in the city of Santa Monica? Well, um, first of all, you have to know what pots you want to go after and be able to prioritize. I mean, right now, like everyone's been saying it, it it truly is an unprecedented amount of money and opportunity um, specifically for sustainability and clean technology so um, you know what we've been trying to do is be strategic about what pots we go after because it is a lot of work to get free money um, I definitely don't want to underestimate that especially for local governments with small staff um, I mean in Santa Monica we're lucky to even have multiple sustainability staff within our office um, that are able to dedicate some time to this. But um, I would say, you know, there are some grant applications that are like dissertations. And so <laughs> it doesn't work to have, um, you know, extremely complicated grant applications um, to have lean staff go after. So um, we tend to go after what we are well positioned to do so. Um, so we're looking at things like grants for um, fleet EV charging infrastructure and resiliency grants um, to help. Um, we're looking for, you know, there's a range, but I would say that being able to have um, partners both within your city and then external stakeholders like community organizations that you already have established relationships with and can lean on and partner with, um, that typically is what works. Good. Um, just quickly, who determines in Santa Monica what works? It's a good question. Um, so, I mean, we, our large umbrella that we operate under in the Office of Sustainability is our Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, um, a council adopted plan. And within that, we have large buckets that we focus on. So, like in most cities, building emissions and transportation emissions are the two largest sources. And so within those buckets, we kind of drill down and see, um, you know, okay, what building facilities can we go after that need to be decarbonized? What um, local um, like community resources, like um, a 
for example, a park that also serves as a community hub mm -hmm. um, that we can use to both provide backup power, but also um, help offset utility costs and help um, be a resource in the event of an emergency or disaster. So it's kind of a mix of what aligns with your existing strategic plan and like identified actions and then what you already have kind of available. Great. So just quickly, you take what but, uh, what you were just saying, uh, Ariana. It's what exists. It's a bunch of humans in getting in rooms, figuring out what works and what exists and where the money is, right? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to take what Matt said this morning, innovate and get beyond that or outside that, you have to find a way to puncture in. Bonnie was suggesting get involved in government, get involved in civic life. Part of the sustainability innovation is being involved, being at the table early to determine what works. How does it work? And then going in to influence local government. Mm -hmm. Let's shift to state. Uh, Mike, you, you worked for many years at um, a wonderful place in the state capitol. Uh, how does that sausage get made and how do, how do things work? How, how do you get the money to work towards what you're after? So I'm a uh, temporarily retired uh, politician, so I feel like I can speak more honestly. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in on a, a secret this morning, and that is what works very little. I'm looking out here and I'm seeing the future of people who are at some point going to be advocating for their companies, advocating in positions of public policy. And the secret answer is at the state level, very little works. Why is that? Well, number one, even though California is very big, we are the fifth largest economy in the world, blah, blah, blah. We cannot deficit finance. We cannot print money. That is the province of the federal government. And so at the state level, we are still forced to spend money that comes from some people in this room. It's taxpayer money. And that those programs that the state passes are often, they are very blunt objects. They have a goal in mind, but how you get from the goal to the actual um, sustainability is very hard. I'll give you an example. There was a very prominent member of the state legislature who wanted to put forth a program to give everybody LED light bulbs. Um, he thought that conventional light bulbs waste a lot of money or waste a lot of energy. They probably do. He wanted to give everybody LED light bulbs. So he put forth million, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to give everybody LED light bulbs. But then the next year it was like, well, people aren't coming to get them. Uh, so people aren't aware of it. Well, of course, this is the last thing on people's minds. So his next bill was for the state to hire people to contact people to give away light bulbs for free. Right. And at some point in the process, like it just occurred to me, I had to vote on this bill. Um, it occurred to me that we are hiring people to give people stuff for free. Right. And, and you think about how strange that is from a government resources standpoint. So there's, that's just one example of many, many, um, the really big ones, they are very controversial. They involve weeks and months and years of debate and California's, uh, you know, uh, percentage of the carbon footprint of the globe is still tiny. It's still tiny. I used to tell my colleagues and I said, I told this to governor Jerry Brown, you want to make a difference at the state level, you run for the U S Senate and you negotiate treaties with India and China. Don't do it here in California. Okay. So that's city waiting at the bottom of the pipe for money that we've applied for state where things not a lot works, but it gets mucked up with legislators and all the stuff that's kind of folds on top of it. But behind that, and we don't have a U.S. government here, but you've got governments that write checks and that's the IRA. That's billions of dollars coming down and they hand it off through the states or directly. And somebody's deciding where that money goes, right? So let's shift our focus now to the national level. We've got Finland here, not the country, but Katya's here. Uh, um, Katya, what, what works? Uh, it's a smaller country, uh, obviously, uh, but what works from your perspective to get that check, the money that's coming down? What works to improve sustainability from the federal government? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, maybe I should give a little bit of a background what Business Finland is and I'm not Finland, but I'm <laughs> representing Finland here. So I work with Business Finland, which is a government agency. We get our we get funding from the government. So we get government money that we're supposed to use and invest to uh, promote the growth of Finnish companies, growth and export and innovation. Um, so basically, it's we are 
in a way, uh, kind of in a state system in the European Union as well. So a lot of the regulation and agreements are uh, done on the EU level. That affects the um, the legislature at the Finland level, which is the other step. And of course, the government decides wh where we're going to go. Um, what are the goals? What are the uh, carbon neutral neutrality goals? And then they give us a chunk of money and say that you we, that's what we need to achieve. Um, so how we work uh, at that point on is that we have are an organization of experts from, from different industries um, and we collaborate. So basically Finland is a small country. We are never going to make it alone in this world. We are built for collaboration. Um, so we th that's basically the foundation that we operate on. So we bring to the table the private sector, the government, Private citizens can often chip in, uh, and then our experts from the expert organization that Business Finland is, and together we look at what makes sense. And whatever we do, um, it's of course value driven, but it always has to uh, make sense also economically. Where, where we where we uh, put our money. Uh, and we invest a lot in innovation down the line. It has to be something where there's a market, where there's an opportunity and where Finland can be competitive. So those are like the main things that uh, affect the decision, decision making. Can you tell me what do you, what do you mean by value driven? Uh, so, well, when I say values, I say that uh, this is probably a bold statement, but I'm ready to make it. Uh, all of the stakeholders in Finland uh, are driving towards the sustainability goals. Uh, and that's also because Finland is a country of rule followers. And if we've agreed, and it's in the law, that we're going to be carbon neutral by 2035, then that's what we're going to do, and we're just going to go to action. So there's not much questioning that. Like, that's just, that's what we do. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> it's just like Sacramento, right? <laughs> Uh, it, it, good. No, that, that it, 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 kidding aside, it, I, I think it's important to note the, the 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 cultural framework here that we're talking about, not just countrywide but statewide and everything else. We're going to get to that in a second. But so you've got a situation where we're going to get to what works and what doesn't work a little bit more. Uh, but I would venture to say that Sacramento doesn't look like we're a place of rule followers uh, where things get done. Uh, and not that people are against the rules, but I think stakeholders, there's a variety of stakeholders that, that differ in how we do what we do at Sacramento or in Santa Monica. It's not not everybody's lockstep step in Sa Sa Santa Monica either, right? No. Um, so uh, this is messy and it's intended to have, have, I wanted to get to the messy part. It's messy, it's not easy. It's a bunch of words on a page and a bunch of money coming down but how the money comes, how the requests come up and the money comes down and where you meet to get to certain goals, even with rule followers, is hard to do. Christine, so we went from city to state to country. You've got an entire continent uh, to deal with. Uh, we talked about this before. I mean, you've had a lot of experience in Hong Kong, but also just in general, the Pan-Asia uh, perspective. Um, from, from your perspective, sustainability goals, um, what works? Maybe I can use um, China as a uh, as the poster child, right? Because what we clearly need, I mean, why are we doing this? Why are we putting all this money out? Um, for example, the uh, panel before, we talked about vehicles, you know, what vehicles need to do, the transit of the technology. We're talking about change management. People need to change. Technology need to change. What are we really doing this for? Because if you don't believe in the green revolution, if you don't believe that all these things have to change and we need to decarbonize, then you know what are we really doing it for, right? But to do it uh, at so many levels, including coming up with the money, the public education, getting it in the city capital, right down to a, a relatively small city like Santa Monica, or in the case in Asia, maybe I'm looking at Hong Kong, seven million people versus you know, Beijing versus China as a whole. So just think that every economy has to think about what they're going to do. And everybody has signed up to decarbonization goals, right? Uh, it may be 2050, 2060, 2070 for India, 2060 for China, 2050 for the United States. So the money is needed because 
we're actually funding a revolution. We're funding a revolution in every sense if we're gonna make all those changes that are gonna happen. So number two is um, if you're making kind of national policy, I think it also depends on what kind of political system you're in. So you have a federal system here and how it works. Um, you can dispute a lot of things with each other. You know, you have a 2050 national goal, but how that's going to be broken down in the different states, uh, well, that's another matter. Now, in China, we have a unitary system. The government says 2060, you know, go. We're going to peak carbon in 2030, go. Then, in a way, they come up with longer term plans. I mean, we now have plans going out to 2050, 2060. Uh, that does make a lot of difference. Now, who's going to come up with the money? Okay, in a, in a place like China and in a place even like Japan and uh, well, in East Asia, right? You know, the government and industry just work very much more closely together. They don't have to be like in China where uh, uh, it's a socialist country where uh, the government, uh, state banks are state owned and so on. You don't have to go to that system to look at the rest of East Asia and the rest of, of a lot of countries in Asia where the relationship between the government, the banks, the investors, the policy priority are much closer. So the kind of collaboration that is possible, the kind of funding of uh, innovation uh, that is very consistent because the policy goal is very consistent. You know, the government tells you, this ain't gonna change for the next 20 years. This is our target. This is the North Star. It makes people looking at how to invest their time and resources, what they teach at schools and so on. Um, I think that really helps. Um, okay, so, so let me riff off of that a little bit. I wanna to talk to, to, to Mike you uh, for a second. What's the downside of having that kind of both clarity and complete you know, adherence to a goal specifically? Yeah, so I hope I don't come across too jaded, but what I, what I beg of all of you when you're thinking about sustainability policy, and again, leaders of the future, right, is to ask tons of questions. For example, there's always what the public thinks. There's the cookie cutter, you know, soundbite version of environmentalism. There's also the, the unintended consequences, and there's all sorts of different things with every policy. I want to give you two examples. Very many people just have that cookie cutter thing. I am going to buy an electric car, therefore I am better. Therefore I am doing my part. Very few people know that in the city of Los Angeles, until I want to say a year and a half ago, the power mix of the city of Los Angeles was in the high 50s, low 60s of fossil fuels. And most of it was coal. And the next bit was oil and some dirty old nat natural gas plants. So when you bought that electric vehicle up until about a year ago in Los Angeles, it was actually worse for the environment. So on the state level, we could incentivize, incentivize, get those electric vehicles, get them, get them, get them. But for people who lived in the most populous city in the state, we were hurting the environment, right? But that does not go to the cookie cutter, you know, like uh, soundbite, you know, the guy who lives in Brentwood and has the, the Tesla and feels really good about himself, right? That, that is what you're up against. A second thing, this just came out last week, it's very timely. When I was in the legislature, we took a step that Europe did a generation ago. We finally banned bags. You guys know when you go to the grocery store now, it costs you a dime to get a bag. And this is what Europe has had for a long, long time. The problem is that America is not Europe, right? In Europe, everybody dutifully brings their bags. As, as Katja said, they, they dutifully bring their bags and the costs are expensive if you don't. In the United States, there was this whole debate. Well, well, we're hurting people. We're hurting poor people. We can't make it more than 10 cents. So I asked in committee and I said, if we're banning those really cheap, thin plastic bags, what's the alternative? And they said, well, paper bags. And I said, so wait a second. So we're taking the lightest product, these little thin plastic bags, and we're replacing them by cutting down trees. And then we're going to haul those trees to a plant where they're going to be made into a very, very heavy product. And then we're going to haul those products all around the country. And they said, oh, no, there's another alternative, too. We're going to let people buy at the point of sale these really cool reusable bags. Well, a study came out last week that said those really cool reusable bags, nobody reuses them. <laughs> they get thrown away. They're just thicker. They're heavier. They take more oil to make. And the companies make more profits. And they're just thrown away anyway. 
right? So you have to be very, very careful when a policy comes before you to really think it through. That is what I beg of you. We need to import more Finnish people who will just follow the rules. <laughs> well, okay, so th that gets at, again, unintended consequences. Money comes down, somebody's designed a policy. Policy has come up from a bunch of well-meaning people in Santa Monica and they get together and they say, we're gonna do this. And I think Matt made reference to there's both incentive, there's, there's a carrot and the stick, we're gonna try the carrot, we're gonna give you incentives, and everybody's gonna do what they do, and they don't. So now you've got all this money that's come down, and you got a program and people are bought into that program and it's hard to get them off buying into that program, even though the evidence is such that it's not working. So what do you say to that? What would you do? How do you adjust um, in midstream? How do you go back to the city manager of Santa Monica and say, hey, we got evidence. This program for which we got $30 million, it's not working. What do you do? I mean, it's a slog, but you got to do it. <laughs> it, it, it requires, you know, going back through the stakeholder engagement process and talking to folks about what worked, what didn't work and what you need to do to actually fix it. And you go back to council and to the commissions that need to weigh in and adopt a new policy. I mean, we've done it time many times are, you know, for various reasons. Um, sometimes you get unprecedented legal challenges to policies, not even in your own city that force you to have to redo a new policy. Um, I'm talking about a building code for new construction that um, some of you may have heard. There was a lawsuit um, against the city of Berkeley's all electric ordinance, which has um, thrown a wrench in um, similar policies. There are over 70 cities throughout the state that have banned um, gas in new construction because it's one of the easy, low-hanging fruit to really reduce carbon emissions from the building sector. You're avoiding locking in the use of gas for the life cycle of the building. So now we have to kind of go back to the drawing board. And there are other options and alternatives, and we just have to be a bit more creative in order to um, be able to stand up to potential future legal challenges. But it's unfortunate to have to dedicate staff time to working on existing building decarb um, to go and rewrite the new construction one. So, you, you know, one of the things that really fascinates me about the U.S. is, and when I've been teaching at Anderson, I mm -hmm. lived in uh, Santa Monica, mm -hmm. but when I went, went to visit my friend in Pasadena, they had another waste program. What, what, what I find amazing about the U.S., which is so unique, is every, every bit has its own ability to make its own rules. So you can actually, I think it can be very wasteful. So for example, in Japan and other places, you have one set of rules for construction that applies to the whole economy. But here you have many, many bits and pieces. So I, I don't know if it's ever possible because that's a political kind of constitutional issue, right? Yeah. And, Jurisdictional. And, and I want to I want to build on that really quickly because I didn't have time. In my last one. But but in that story of Los Angeles, right, and how we've gradually shifted away, um, Christine raises a really important point. So Los Angeles now, when you plug in your Tesla, you can feel a little bit better because the, the power <laughs> mix is good. But we're still not done with our questions. The next question to ask is what became of that coal power plant that we used to have a contract with to get our power? Well, the answer is the red states just bought the power. It's still operating. Utah, Arizona are like, give me those electrons, right? So we have not done anything for the, for the, for the globe. That coal power plant is still going because there, as Christine hit, she hit the nail on the head. The United States is chaos. Federalism is chaos. And we've got different rules and vastly different political opinions. And there are some people who welcome that cheap coal fire power and it's still going somewhere. Right. So very good point. Cool. We're going to try and move to a little uplifting, but uh, <laughs> but, but I, I have a different take on it. Push back a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah. and say that not everyone is sucking up the new coal. Yeah. There's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and by the, way, that, it, the it, market it, is, it, turning. is changing. And I live in Pasadena and there's a whole controversy about the, the IPP, that, that space, right? And what you do with that. I was going to say that those investments are not short term investments. You don't just term. These are 30 and 40 year investments that have depreciation cycles. And they've got a whole model invested in that investment. You can't just kind of say, well, we're going to change. You can if you're, as you mentioned, if you're China, you can say, well, we're just going to do that. 
Everybody move out of the way. It's easier to do. Oh, well, We're going to okay. get to Finland in the same Yeah, yeah. But I just want to say, okay, U.S. carbon emissions, 12% of the world, China, 28%, yeah. right? Yeah. So we've got a really long way to go. Yeah. And I think the government, successive governments, right, because we do have a, a North Star, you are going to have to provide power for 1.4 million people. That is also the factory of the world, right? B B you know, China's, it's almost the largest trading partner for most of the world, right? So the emissions that you can reduce in China, right? We talked about supply chain, scope three, stuff that are made elsewhere in the world. You want to know that they are making a big effort to decarbonize, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, China is kind of at the moment where they're adding coal plants because they can't, can't have brownouts, but at the same time, they're building out renewable power like, uh, you know, like, like pigs can business. fly, you That's know? Right. And the, the two at some stage will come together where emissions will begin to fall. And, you know, the Chinese ship, for example, that sails into uh, Long Beach, uh, that whole chain, the cargo that are in it, you know, that whole chain will be a part of your business. And you want, in a way, China to succeed, not to fail mm -hmm. because of its special conditions. And it's so important for US and China to cooperate. I mean, I know things are difficult at the moment, but maybe at the port level with the shipping companies, with the shipbuilders. So you can look at different industries and see what your supply chain looks like and work each one of those to see how you can decarbonize. Pick your spots, I think is what I heard. So California's chaos. <laughs> We're controlled. Santa Monica is creative and innovative. And well. <laughs> How about Finland? Is Finland chaotic or Finland controlled? Or, uh, um. Well, I would say that what works for us is, of course, um, listening to all this and having lived in the U.S. for 10 years, I, of course, understand that there's unique challenges here and there's no way we can compare Finland uh, to the U.S. And one of those reasons is that we have a very trust-based society. Like we, the different parts of the uh, society trust each other. Um, I guess that's the shared values part. It's not different from here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which also means that uh, change in government is usually not a big change. We, we have a coalition government. So, and when we always try to seek consensus, it means that it might take longer to reach decisions. Uh, but then everybody's on board and that's the way we're going to go. And there's... Um, no chaos in that sense. And there's no, like, every four years uh, we throw out those regulations and bring these ones in. Uh, so there's kind of, you can trust to build your business over there and innovate over there in an area like clean tech where the results and the a business model doesn't really actualize until way maybe 10 years, in a 10 years timeline. Uh, so you need that trust that this uh, is a stable environment to do those innovations. And to some degree in the United States, you, you can't have a policy. You can't have a policy that incents a business to do something and then pull the rug out. So there's safeguards there. But this word innovation, you know, it, it's a messy space. You're all going to be in a messy space. And to some degree, the North Star, the clarity, everybody following the rules, right? Somehow kind of have an impact on innovation, um, but it can get you sort of far down the road, right? I, I think there's a balance that we're hearing here. Um, I got, we got a couple, one more. Anybody want to comment on that, the balance of chaos versus not chaos before we get to questions? Even in China, there's a lot of chaos. Yeah, I was just, you know, I didn't want to say yeah, that. No, but, no, no, it's complete uh, chaos, yeah. right? You, it, there are chaos at different levels because That's you're funny. still dealing with institutions and human right. beings. So I really appreciate it. I think Nikki talking about change management. Mm -hmm. And if you can see change management in a cultural sense, then I think it helps people to think through that in your different global markets, uh, people react very differently to change. So how can you look, you know, wherever you're operating, what does change management mean for you to take all those steps? And some of them are technical. You're going to have to solve those technical problems to move forward. And then application, you know, you're going to get all your colleagues to follow that and then your customers, right? I mean, all of that however you look at it, whatever culture you come from, it's going to require collaboration and a lot of right communication. Mm -hmm. So 
that has to be a really dedicated function for companies within itself, with its supply chain up and down, with government. They need to hear what's working, what's not working. Uh, and hopefully they're willing to make adjustments because they're willing to work closer with you to see what's already not working rather than you coming back five years later on and so, say, well, yeah. that didn't work. Uh, just a real quick um, example, by the way, um, for those in the old enough in the, in the room here who remember uh, soda, soda cans used to have tops when you pulled them off, right? And you were able to throw them away. So the younger people are like, throw them away. What? No, you used to be able to throw them away. And there was a whole move at the time for ecology to, no, don't pollute, don't pollute, don't pollute, don't pollute. And they were all over the place, right, Bonnie? Well, now when you open a soda can, it stays there, right? Because the soda can companies were told. We have that for plastic bottles in yeah. Europe nowadays. Yeah, and I, and I think our plastic bottles actually have it. It, it stays. But yeah, it, you can either incent it or encourage it, or you can demand it somebody's going to have to pay for it, and that's the bucket of money that comes down somehow, or it's in the price of the bottle or the can. One way or the other, you're gonna change behavior, or you're gonna change the product, right? Uh, and so th that's where we're, we're trying to talk about how do you keep innovation, but also get stuff to actually happen through government. And, and I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like California is totally dysfunctional. I mean, most of you are probably saying, "Well, it kind of is." But you've but, already but, said it. But the, 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 Cal, the, the, Cal, the California legislature is an amazingly adept place, and we have passed so many innovative things in the field of sustainability. Uh, and it is way less gridlocked than the U.S. Congress. Uh, the California legislature votes on two thousand five hundred bills every two years which is roughly you know, 1,200, 1,250 a year. Um, one of the things that I miss about being there is I could wake up in January and say, I want to bring back black license plates. By August, it was the law of the land. By January, they were making black license plates again, right? We're very, very adept. And that goes for sustainability ideas too. But that speed at which we operate, the, the bill factory, the fact that California, you know, Congress will pass five bills a year and California will pass 700 bills a year, right? That speed at which we operate is also a bad point because sometimes we don't take a deep breath. We don't think things out that well. We go in a million different directions. But, you know, again, the message yeah. is take a deep breath when, before you propose something, think it through, make sure it's very, very sound policy. That's all. Good. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have some questions. So I'm going to start with you, Ariana, because it says at the municipal or neighborhood level, what are effective ways to inform and persuade residents and stakeholders to participate in sustainable programs? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think there are a number of different channels that we use. You know, we have um, Santa Monica, we have a particularly engaged um, <laughs> municipality um, group of residents, which is great um, and makes it easier to get feedback. But I think just, you know, the, the regular ways in which we communicate are through public meetings, um, by having um, public events for folks to weigh in, um, getting the word out about new programs or policies through um, our newsletters, our social media channels, our platforms. Um, those are kind of the typical ways. But we also engage um, community organizations. Like we partner with a great organization, Sustainable Work, that, Sustainable Works, that does direct engagement with businesses to enroll in our sustainable business program. Um, residents who are interested can also come to um, our sustainability meetings. Um, there used to be called the Task Force on the Environment, now the Commission on um, Sustainability, Equity, and Environmental Justice um, that are held monthly. And then um, our community partners also help um, put on different events throughout the year. Um, and we have a lot of really amazing interns and fellows that have been working um, to put on events like at our parks. Um, we have some community gardens. Um, but if you're interested in specific ways that you can in adopt sustainability policies or take advantage of incentives, um, our Office of Sustainability website has information on our rebates, for example, we offer through our Electrify Santa Monica rebate program. Um, so those are some ways. So, and in a democratic system, you you, you engage the populace, mm -hmm. um, or you tell them what to do, or you engage them to <clears throat> do something, and you bring them involved in the process and all that stuff. Like, uh, do you see that kind of dynamic either in Finland or in, in Asia, in various parts of Asia? 
Well, of course, in China, we have a very different neighborhood system, right? You know, you have one kind of literature that tells you this is, you know, really problematic because you have neighborhood people who have designated jobs to reach out. Now, the flip side of it, if you need to uh, communicate some big new policy like waste separation, the same system is out there telling everybody how to do it, where to do it, when to do it. You know, so there's massive system of public communication uh, actually works too. What, what, when they follow the rules. Well, generally yeah. they follow the rules, yes. Right. Well, you know, this notion of higher trust, lower trust society is very interesting. And I, I do, this is why, you know, every little bit in, in I guess, even in one country, uh, maybe the trust level isn't necessarily the same when you're talking about the size of the US or China. But mm. nevertheless, how people see what their neighbors are going to do. I mean, you are going to do uh, something that is mandated because you believe everybody else is going to do it. If you don't believe that, then, well, I'm just going to throw it here. Can I, uh, how many of you have been to Japan? <clears throat> how many trash cans are in Japan? Public trash cans? Zero. We visited, and literally my kingdom for a trash can, we had trash. And you would, from my orientation, I would expect to see stuff on the ground, spotless. Take People it home. take your trash. Right? That's with what you. is expected. You take it and, home. And the trash cans not being there had nothing to do with the environment. It had to do with a Syrian scare that someone put in a trash can. That's what we were told, right? So it had to do with it, security. And then they never thought to bring the trash cans back. And so. Well, I tell you a story that nobody, I. There's no trash cans. I actually. <laughs> uh, I was in a room with uh, municipal government officials who were taking care of waste. And I attended that forum on behalf of Hong Kong to learn what other places are doing because we were putting in a new waste system. So there was uh, people from Europe who were speaking. There were people, someone from Japan, someone from the, the, one of the cities in the US, I think it was Houston. So you have the Japanese who talked about, well, we have trained now three generations of people to separate waste. I mean, they have the most amazing waste separation system of everything in the world. Then they recycle. Then we had the Europeans. The Europeans basically said, look, we've gone a long way. We're not as uh, picky as the Japanese, but we, uh, uh, you could say they, they've gone halfway. Then in the United States, the, the message was, in the US, we, we believe in technology. It'd be very difficult to ask Americans to separate. Therefore, we asked them to throw it all in a couple of bins, and then some machine somewhere, out of sight, out of mind, well, I want to see separate, that machine. Right? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Having lived here, I'm not sure what it looks like. But what I'm saying is, that's cultural, right? That's cultural. The Japanese are willing to do it, and they want to do it, and they practice doing it. They're going to continue doing it. The Europeans say, well, I'm halfway there. It works for us. And I think the Americans are saying, no, 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 they can't rely on my people. <laughs> I, I, vi visiting one of these... MRFs, they're called MRFs. I forget what it stands for. It's multi-resource facility or something like that. Is a religious experience. I mean, there is a giant, giant machine that is bigger than this building that, you know, first there's a big magnet and it pulls out all the iron, right? And then there's something that like they fill it all with water and it floats up all the cans and bottles. And then like a little thing comes into, I mean, it is crazy what we expect. I got to take these tours when I was in the legislature. I should also tell you while we're on the topic of sustainability that it is perceived in America that you cannot serve an American an almond with a little bit of the a little fleck of the brown missing from the almond. We ship those to Europe and to Asia. Um, same thing with damaged fruit. It is listen to it is so horrendous. We, we'd like to think, especially in California, that we're really great with sustainability. But but like you cannot sell an orange in a major grocery store unless the ratio of sugar is 14 to one and it's got to be round and it can't have any everything that is damaged we ship overseas at great cost it is crazy do you want to comment on um, i have a specific question i, I didn't come here to this the us so <laughs> i'll just leave it there okay all right well, well well good we have a question for you about the finnish space uh, as a space industry professional i noticed that finnish space startups have been unusually successful um ICA, kuva space why do you think that is uh, well, I think it all goes back to our very big knowledge space in technology in general. 
Um, so as you know, as everybody knows, I'm sure that Nokia, uh, Nokia comes from Finland. That's a big technology company uh, from Finland. It's still around and it's still big. They just don't make phones anymore. So that's why you don't think about it. My husband works with Nokia. So they, there you go. They innovated. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are the innovators. So basically, uh, that's one thing. We have a big... Um, we have a lot of engineers in Finland, let's put it that way. Um, and also, I would like to take the credit to the Finnish system of investing in innovation. So that's last year, Business Finland gave out a little bit over 700 million euros to, fin to the Finnish economy. And 600,000 out of that went to companies. And 400,000 from that went to innovation and development of new things. Um, so we really heavily invest in that. And a lot of the, uh, when we give the, out that money, there's also an expectation and sometimes requirement that they also do international collaboration. Uh, so uh, that's part of my job over here is to find partners for Finnish companies uh, to collaborate with and also look for opportunities for Finnish companies to come here because we're a small country and we need to export. So I would say those are the two things why we have great technology companies. I suspect you're going to have to give business cards in a moment. <laughs> uh, let's let's round it out. Let's finish off by saying, uh, what would you tell this group of people both, both how to get the money that's coming down from the IRA and everywhere else, or how to influence where the money goes so that it actually has impact on something that works? Let's We're going to go this way, so. How, how, what would you tell this group of smart people? I mean, I think from what I've seen that works well are when you have a good mix of um, utilizing both um, the market and really engaging the companies um, and coupling it with strong policy. So um, I'm just thinking of current programs that have done a good job of using money. And I think of the Tech Clean California rebate program, which um, is a rate payer funded program administered by the CPUC. And they um, essentially engaged contractors, um, had a really strong outreach campaign um, with education, and it was to replace um, existing space and water heaters with heat pumps. And the funding actually just ran out up in PG&E territory for single family homes. But um, the reason the funding actually was utilized because there was a lot of outreach and education. They engaged the people who are actually doing the work and taught contractors and how to do a wraparound service. Um, and then the, you know, the end user, the customer has the benefit of having a more sustainable, uh, more efficient, um, either heat pump HVAC system or heat pump water heater system. So okay. All that to say, I think just looking for those synergies, you know, you can have a great idea, but not great implementation tactics. And you can have um, a great policy, but no one knows about it or how to use it. Um, so looking for those synergies, I think, is is really okay. important. Good. What works? Um, just two points. One is don't look at down on really simple things like heat pumps. Um, they're really effective. Uh, the bigger point is uh, because we're in a competitive, we're, you know, economies and industries are competitive, it's really important to go outside and look at who's doing what and how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to just take an example, you know, like solar panels, right? China provides 80% of the solar panels of the world. How did they grow in 20 years from zero to where they are today? And what are the problems they need to face? Great business school study case. Matt talked about that brick wall. You have to figure out how to go over it or around it or under it or whatever. That's the innovation part. Don't just stop at the brick wall and say, okay, here's my wall. Sometimes it's worth figuring out. Yeah, the wall works. Or sometimes, how do I get around it? Katya. Um, I also have two things. One thing is that uh, creating a sustainable future requires everybody. Citizens, private sector, public sector. And you're going to be leaders in that world. So bring your values with you. Whatever you learn here, don't leave that at the door when you enter a big corporation. Uh, instead, take that as a given, like we need to create a sustainable future and what is what can I do in this small space to uh, drive for that? And secondly, uh, a little commercial. So Business Finland has been partnering with UCLA for many, many years. We bring a lot of Finnish companies here to the uh, Global Access Program as clients. So if that's in your future, doing the Global Access Program, 
or uh, Business Finland is currently uh, a client at the, at the SMR program. So there's chances for you to work with Finnish companies and maybe find great uh, opportunities for you to come to Finland. We would love to have you there. How many of you are rule followers? <laughs> okay, you we can got, come and uh, disrupt there. a you, little. You, you, these two could come. The rest of you got to stay here. Uh, Michael. To get anything done from the government, you need to pick a coalition of the four P's, policy, politics, press, and people. You need to have sound policy. Um, you need to have um, the politics going your way. That means special interest groups. Um, you need the press, the media to take notice of your idea, and you need people power. You can get stuff done if you have 50% of those four. Um, if you have 100%, it's going to get done. If you have 75%, there's a good chance. 50%, 50% chance. Notice though that if you don't have good policy, but you still have press, politics, and people, you can get something done. But the best thing to do is start with good policy, get some people power, get the media to pay attention as well, and you'll have a good chance of getting what you want. Thank you all.